This morning we read from the creation story found in the first and second chapter of the book of Genesis. We will begin our reading with the 31st verse of this first chapter and read through the third verse of the second chapter. I invite you to hear God's word for us this morning. God saw that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. The word of God for the people of God. Once again, I, I want to welcome you into worship this day. And if you're visiting with us, we, we hope that you'll consider becoming a part of, uh, of our family of faith. Um, to say that we're, we're, we're growing would be an understatement. We were seeking to, to go deeper in our understanding of who God is and how God calls us to, to understand our world. And, and it's kind of in that vein that, that we're embarking on this sermon series. The questions of life. I mean, I think we all have those questions that we ask that we really don't know how to answer. And, and as we seek to answer some of the more harder, more difficult questions, I, I pray that today that you will uh, have an open mind and realize the greatest thing about, about our faith is that there's a wide breadth of understanding that many of us share. And uh, one of the greatest things we can do is just be, be compassionate and, and respectful of others as we grow together in our journey with God. Would you bow your hearts and your heads as we go to, to God in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the many ways that you bless us. Lord, we love you. And we ask that you would guide our hearts and our minds as we, as we open your word today. Lord, we, we seek your face and give it all to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to begin today by sharing a story of three men who just found themselves going out on a fishing trip together. And of course, as the story goes, as they got out on open water, they encountered a storm, and, and before long there was a problem and the ship went down. Just by a miraculous event, the three were able to swim together to shore of a deserted island. Well, at first things were okay, but things got rougher and rougher, and after the first week, two of the guys really wanted to find a way off. One was a cattle rancher from Texas, the other a cab driver from New York. And as the three of them were walking across, the, the one that wasn't so antsy to get off was just someone that was just kind of a laid-back guy that liked everything, stumbled across a lamp, an antique lamp, and as he picked it up and rubbed it, this genie appeared and the genie says for freeing me from my prison I will grant each of you one wish well the cattle guy says well, I miss my ranch I wish to go home with poof the guy disappeared the cab driver from New York says I miss the hustle and bustle of nature and all the people I get to see I, I, I wish I was back in New York and poof he was gone well, as Jeannie turned to the third guy, who was looking somewhat despondent and depressed, he says, so what can I do for you? He says, you know, I, with the, the other guys, I'm kind of lonely. I kind of wish they were back. <laughs> poof, poof. <laughs> so much for wishing, right? Oh, I thought that was good. Well, believe it or not, I think we all have a wish list. Right? Some of us wish for the lottery. Others of us wish for better jobs. There are those of us that wish that our, our marriage was more loving and fulfilling. There's those that wish that their life was not so hectic. I mean, we wish and we wish and we wish because we believe if we can ever get that combination of earthly factors together, our lives have to be better. Well, here's the thing that I want to say to you this morning. I know you've heard it before. But the answers to the questions of life are not found in our situations, our efforts, or our achievements. Those things are, are found in something much greater than these. They're found in Almighty God. And here's the first thing I want you to think about, and this is your first point to ponder. 
God desires to be found. I mean, that, that may be something that's hard for us to fathom, but God desires to be found. And if we don't believe it, all we've got to do is turn to Scripture. And there in Romans 1, verse 20, we're told, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. I mean, I don't think it's a stretch for us to, to think God wants to be known. I mean, all we have to do is walk outside and see the beauty of a, of a, of a Texas sunrise or, or the way in which just spending time with those that we love. Through those things, we, we experience God in amazing ways. It, through those, God is known. I think one of the problems, though, is we go farther and farther in our journey in this world. I don't think it would be a stretch to say that many of us feel more distant than ever from God. And that's kind of troubling to me. I think one reason that we find ourselves often more distant than we need be is because of the busyness of our life. I mean, we're so distracted with kids, with job, with obligation, with recreation, with this, with that. We look up and another week, month, year has gone. So I think our busyness puts distance between us and God. I think throughout history, if you look into the Bible, you'll find that prosperity, times when, when societies have done well, put distance between those of faith and God. And I think for the United States, our world, many, the prosperity that we're enjoying right now also puts God, puts space between us and God. But, but I think one of the things that's most troubling for me is as far as finding space between us and the one that created us, is that many of us have bought into the current beliefs of our time. And God has become less and less relevant to the world in which we live. I mean, if you think about it, there are those that believe it's only a matter of time before science proves that God doesn't exist. I love the apocryphal story. That's one that's not true. But the apocryphal story of a time in the future when science can come to that place where they, they can do anything God can do. And, and in that time, the story, it shares a, a conversation that went on between science and God, and it goes like this. It says, well, God, you can pretty much take a break. We can do all that you can do. So, God, if you want to, you can go off and create even another world. We got this one taken care of. To which God <laughs> responds, oh, so that's so. Can you create human beings? Scientist says, yep, out of the dust of the earth. Even make them live. Well, God just says, well, I'd like to see that. To which the scientists reach down and grab a clump of dirt. And God says, uh-uh, find your own dirt. <laughs> You'll get that later, Charlie. <laughs> but there is no doubt that there is, there is a difference between those who seek the tangible and concrete explanations of our origin, our design, and our destination, those who cling to science, and those who seek to explore something more, something beyond the taste and the touch, the things that, that our worldly senses can ever provide. In our day and time, I, I don't believe society has been ever more divided between those who, who follow God and those who, who cling to science. It's a hotbed issue, one that, that I find myself often worry about broaching because I hate to be across the table with someone that disagrees with me because it won't take long before the, the words become heated and, and everybody's wrong and emotions run thin. You know, there have been a number of attempts to try to figure out how we might bridge the, the, the chasm between faith and science. And, and my favorite one I, I found on the internet, it goes like this. Y'all's humor is kind of needing some help today. That's funny. I don't care who you are. 
Well, it can be easy for us to get, here's, here, it can be easy for us to forget that, that whether you're a scientist or whether you're a Christian, I think we're all searching for answers. We're earnestly looking to, to make sen sense of the lives that, that we've been given. I think we all know that there, there are hidden secrets that, that hopefully will, will unlock the door in the truth about the meaning of life. As we think about our faith in science, we both have different ways that we approach what we have. From a Christian perspective, we, we go to the book of Genesis, and there we, we read a wonderful story. Which begins in this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens in the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. You know, and in reading that, we find that, 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 that days pass as, as God's creation takes more and more form and more and more complexity and ends with, with the passage with which Shirley read this morning. As we read that, we, we feel warm and, and fuzzy in knowing that God loved us so much that He was so intimately and intricately involved. But as we, we bask in the warmth of that, in the back a scientist raises his hand and goes, said, okay, I can do that, but, but what do you do with the dinosaurs? I mean, th there is no evidence of them being here since the time of Adam. And they're dated far beyond what the creations believe the world to be, which is somewhere between six and 10,000 years. So what do we as faith-based people do in response to those kind of questions? <laughs> On the other side of the coin, you have the scientists who believe that, that the natural world has left behind a fossil trail to explain how we have come into being. And as they lay out this, 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 this path, Christians stand up and say, you know, that makes somewhat sense to me, but, but there are holes there that I, I can't make the jump from. I mean, how come in all the things we have found, we have not found any mutations from one species to another, like half-developed wings. And no matter where we are in between those two spectrums, we all have questions. For me, I wonder how we, we the beings that we are with the intellect and the morality and the conscience that we have got to where we were if we started as just a primordial ooze. You know, the trouble is that if we're not careful, we, we find ourselves baited into believing that, that, that it's only one side or the other. We find ourselves believing we have to be either this or that. We feel as if there's no real way for, for God and science to coexist within the, the same realm of exploration without losing or devaluing our beliefs or understanding. You know, when you think about it, there is no doubt that there are differences between both sides, but, but if we inspect much closer to what the surface says, I don't believe that God and science are, are truly as mutually exclusive as if, as if what they may seem. In all honesty, what they do is they chase two different sets of truth. From a science perspective, they seek to explore the what, the how, and the when of how we came into being. They go out and they dig and they look and they examine, trying to, to make sense of those three questions. 
But from a faith standpoint, we, we seek something different than that. We seek to understand and connect with something that as the Scripture says is far less visible to the physical world. And yet, its evidence is just as basic. You see, we, from a faith standpoint, seek to explain the who and the why of, of our creation. And I find it amazing that because a lot of what God has in our world is not visibly qualitative, we find ourselves having to defend and, and protect our understanding of who God is. But sometimes our efforts speak more about us and our fears than God and God's power. I'm sure many of y'all remember in years past, there was a man named Copernicus. And he theorized that quite possibly the earth was not the center of the universe. That maybe we revolved around something even larger. To the religious people of his day, they said heresy. Later, a man named Galileo spent a large portion of his life behind bars because he voiced an opinion that was different than the faith-based society that he was in. But as times passed, isn't it true that the discovery that Copernicus came from opened the world to an even greater understanding of what God did through creation than we ever would have known without that scientific find? You know, in our day, evolution for a long time has been associated with a godless philosophy, mostly associated with atheists. Feeling that, that there's no place in that for God to have anything to do with it. But in reality, in Darwin's writing, there's no evidence of his writings trying to undermine who God was. I'm reading a book that was done by Dennis Alexander, and the name of the book is Creation or Evolution, Do We Have to Choose? And one thing that he says about the origins of species, the book that was written by Darwin, the first edition, I didn't know, nowhere in that first book was the word evolution ever mentioned. But the words creation, creator, and created was mentioned over 104 times. Oftentimes, we, as, faith, uh, as a faith-based people, criticize atheist scientists for their poor grasp on theology when in fact there are times that, that we are invited to, to have a better hold about what God did through his Bible. You know, we sometimes struggle with needing to, and knowing which passages of Scripture to take literally and which are more figurative and latent in nature. I mean, it's not hard for us to recognize when Jesus in the New Testament says, if your hand sins, cut it off. It's not hard for us to realize that that, that was not a direct command for us. But a way in which Jesus could let us know just how important it was to get sin out of our life. And as we look at the story of creation, we, we find it hard to even wrestle with the idea that possibly the story that's shared in the Old Testament speaks of, a, of an even greater event than we can imagine and human minds can conceive. I mean, think about it. Does that really belittle our understanding of who God is? Or the great love that, that flowed out as He created humanity? I 
I have a, a spiritual mentor that, that I often run by things whenever I find myself kind of struggling with where I might go with something. And, and my mentor's name's Carl Rolfs, and he's the district superintendent in San Antonio. And, and we're talking about this, and, and he shared this thought. He said, scientists do not compete with Scripture. In fact, as scientists discover more and more of the intricacies of creation, the theological questions of who and why cry louder for response. God, though available in time and space, is not confined to time and space. We're the ones confined to time and space. We're the ones gifted with inquisitive minds to discover the intricacies of creation. We're the ones who eventually peek into spaces that defy our intellectual grasp. And when we do, I believe, I believe it's precisely at that point we see a glimpse of eternity. And note that there is something beyond ourselves that's not limited to time and space. But by whatever name we call it, is that not God? <coughs> you know, it's funny what happens to us as we move farther and farther down the road of development. Progress. I mean, in times past, theology and science weren't separated, but theology was theology or, or the study of God was considered the queen of sciences because that's where all came together to find meaning and purpose. I mean, it's in our theology that we, we answer the questions who and why. It's there that the answers that, that provide for the life that we seek come into focus. Another cartoon that was shared a number of years ago was of a soul mountain that was uh, in the middle of a frame. And on every side, there was a, a scientist of, from every area climbing to the top. There you found geologists, sociologists, biologists, physicists, physicians, paleontologists, anthropologists, chemists, and on and on. And as they arrived at the peak of their journey, finally making the top, there was a theologian there who greeted them with these words, welcome. I've been waiting for you. You know, the biblical doctrine of creation tells us about a dynamic process in which God is the author and the narrator of all we have. The Bible tells us that, that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In truth, God's creation encompasses both the past, the present, and the future. And no matter what avenue with which we ask our questions, they all will point back to God. The relationship with, with God and science does not have to be an either-or proposition. It can be a both-and equation. And as we open our, our minds and our eyes, I think all roads will point back to a loving God who out of that love created you and me. And as we find God, that which science alone can't prove, meaning, purpose, 
hope and salvation. It's there where all the pieces of the puzzle come together. You see, one, science, absent the other, is meaningless. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for the many blessings that you share with us. And Lord, we even thank you so much for the questions that we have that haunt us in the dark of night. Lord, Scripture speaks of struggles that we have, struggles that we face. It tells us that, that instead of running from them, we should embrace them because it's there that we mature and, and grow in faith. Lord, this day, I ask that you would allow your spirit to speak with us and carry on the conversation that we began, drawing us closer, revealing your presence, and allowing us to better understand this puzzle of life. In Christ's name we pray.